Thank you, Tim. Well, what a great pleasure to be here. It's uh, really one of my very favorite meetings because this meeting is a little less about the scientific detail and a lot more about the patients, their caregivers, and the reality of the lives that you live. So I feel honored to be here and I want to make myself absolutely accessible to whatever questions that you may have during my talk, after my talk, or later tonight. So my background is in basic science. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about where I came from and how I got into studying hereditary spastic paraplegia. But I'll just start out by saying that my training is not as a neurologist. It's not disease. My training is in basic science, basic developmental neurobiology. I'm a cell biologist. I'm interested in cellular mechanisms. And the thing that I'm interested most in is microtubules. So you heard Frank's talk just a moment ago about microtubules as really being one of the factors, one of the structures that are really vulnerable and very relevant to hereditary spastic paraplegia. And that's really how I got into all of this, is that I've studied microtubules and neurons now for probably about 30, 35 years, if you want to include my graduate studies as well. So I've been a person who's studied all sorts of different proteins and mechanisms related to microtubules. I didn't know a whole lot about hereditary spastic paraplegia until it was discovered that spastin is a microtubule severing protein. But what I've learned are the sorts of things that many people in this audience have lived. And these things are summarized, a few of them here, that in hereditary spastic paraplegia, the principal complaint is gait deficiencies. So people have trouble walking, and sometimes this is just a bit of trouble, the need for a cane or some sort of assistance. And then it can go all the way to a wheelchair, ultimately. Not always, though. It varies a lot. There's also, of course, spasticity, weakness of the lower limbs. Now, it's usually adult onset. Depends on the particular type of hereditary spastic paraplegia. And I know that there's some younger people in the room who are suffering. But the average age is about 45 years old. But even that depends upon when the patient becomes cognizant. Because some people are just not complainers. They may not complain until they're 45 years old. But they may suffer some defects along the way. There's a lot of variability among patients. Some patients may have the genetic mutation for hereditary spastic paraplegia, but go throughout their entire life and be, for the most part, OK. Other patients may suffer early on and quite a bit more. And this is patients in the same family. So it's not just simply the mutation that determines the severity of the symptoms. There has to be other factors as well. There may be gender differences. Now with hereditary spastic paraplegia, the main anatomical issue is degeneration of the cortical spinal tracts. Now what we mean by cortical spinal tracts are neurons that start out in the brain, that's where the cell body of the neuron is, then it extends its elongated process down the spinal cord. There's going to be another neuron onto which it synapses, but it's that upper motor neuron that principally degenerates in hereditary spastic paraplegia. Now, clinically, the reality is no disease is exclusive to one cell type. And in different patients, there can be some degeneration of some other cell types as well. But principally, we think about HSP as degeneration of cortical spinal tracts. Usually, there are no developmental problems. It's not as if a baby is born and already it's suffering from some sort of symptoms, at least not in most forms of hereditary spastic paraplegia. And sometimes there are other issues. Sometimes there are complicated, complicating issues of cognition and different sorts of things. And so no disease is, is, is purely defined by very simple uh, symptoms. <clears throat> 
Now, as I said, I got into all of this as a basic scientist. And then there are also the clinicians. And it turns out that most diseases are defined clinically and not by basic scientists. So what clinicians do is they gather up the constellation of symptoms and then they categorize diseases according to their symptoms. If basic scientists were in charge of all of this, we would probably categorize diseases according to mechanism, not according to symptoms. So when we say hereditary spastic paraplegia, the way this is defined is by a set of symptoms. And we just talked about some of those symptoms. But it may not be one disease. It may be a whole bunch of diseases that look alike, but may not, in fact, be alike. The one thing about hereditary spastic paraplegias that are all in common is that they're genetic diseases. They're hereditary. That's what hereditary means. Is it all one disease? Now, maybe it's a bunch of different diseases, but they converge on a common mechanism. So in practice, in reality, it is more like one disease, but we really just don't know that yet. Now, if you look at this graph, you can see a few of the different genes that are common in hereditary spastic paraplegia. SPG4 is at least 40% of the known cases. That's the big one, and that's the one that I'll talk about primarily in my presentation today. But many of you that I've talked with today, people suffering from SPG11, SPG7, there's a growing number of genes associated with hereditary spastic paraplegia. Now, I used to show, the last time I presented to this audience, a simple chart of about eight different genes that are mutated in, in HSP. It has grown substantially over the eight or nine years since I've spoken to this meeting. And I was going to say it's about 80 different genes now. And then I heard somebody tell me today that it was 93. So it's an ever-growing number of genes. So that a lot of the patients who are suffering the constellation of symptoms that clinicians call hereditary spastic paraplegia, they don't have a known gene mutation. It hasn't been discovered yet. So it's, it's a very interesting fledgling field where we're just becoming aware of a vast number of genes whose mutations give rise to these symptoms. Now, what do we mean by genetic mutations? What I'm showing here in this, in this picture is chromosomes. So humans, all living creatures, have these chromosomes. And they all have a genetic code. So here is how we inherit our genetic code from our parents. Now, some of these genes, most of the genes, are autosomal, meaning that you get them from your father or your mother. Some are sex-linked meaning that you could only get this gene from your mother, you could only get this gene from your father. SPG4, the one that I study and the one that's most prevalent, is autosomal dominant. Some are, are autosomal, but they're recessive. That means that if they're recessive, you have to get one from your mother and one from your father, otherwise you're okay. And in a disease such as hereditary spastic paraplegia that is so rare in the first place to, to have the disease with, with, with uh, a recessive situation is very unfortunate and not at all common. It's not likely that anyone in your family is going to have the disease, but all of a sudden you have, have a child who does. So spastin is the protein that the gene encodes for. So the gene is called SPG4, or nowadays it's called SPAST. And it encodes for a protein called spastin. For many years, I would say up until around the year 2000 or so, nobody really knew what spastin was. It was named SPAST or spastin because it is the gene most commonly mutated in HSP. So that's why it was called SPAST. But nobody ever really knew what it, what, it, what it was. And it was discovered around 2002, or at least reported around 2002, that spastin severs microtubules. 
If you look at the code, the amino acid code for the spastin protein, there are parts of the protein that are very, very similar to a protein called catonin. Catonin was already known as a microtubule severing protein, and I studied catonin in my lab at the time. When people looked at spastin and said, look, it looks a lot like catonin, and then realized, well, this could be a microtubule severing protein, tested it out, and indeed it was, and then suddenly this disease was opened up mechanistically in a way that it never was before. So as I said, I've spent my career studying microtubules, and it was mentioned previously in Frank's talk that microtubules are these structural elements that, that fill up these we would call axons, these elongated nerves that come from the cell bodies. And these microtubules are both structural, allowing neurons to take on these long, long processes, but then also they're, they're like railroads. They're like railroads along which nutrients and organelles, all, all sorts of things, move up and down the length of the axon. So they're important for architecture and they're important for transport. I got my start at Michigan State University, and I was a graduate student at Michigan State, and for some reason I was very interested in microtubules. You might ask me why. I probably couldn't give you a very good answer. They just always interested me. So I found the one lab at Michigan State that studied microtubules, and I got into that lab. And that guy was not a neuroscientist, my mentor, but he was starting to realize neurons are full of microtubules, so why not study them? So that's how I got my start studying microtubules and neurons. I wanted to work with a real neuroscientist for my postdoctoral work, so I went to Temple University in Philadelphia, and I worked with a fellow called Mark Black, who was an expert on microtubules. Then for my first faculty job, I went to University of Wisconsin in Madison, and I was there for 10 years, always studying basic science, always basic science. When I moved 20 years ago to Drexel University back in Philadelphia, I was still pretty much a basic scientist. How do axons grow? How do they branch? How do neurons migrate through the brain? How are dendrites different from axons? All these kind of developmental issues of, of neurobiology. I started to study disease for a couple of reasons. One is there's simply more funding for research in disease. And to keep my lab going, I had to move into disease. But the much more important reason is all those years of basic research really had a promise. And that was that one day, one day by doing all of this basic research, that we would be able to solve the mysteries of disease. So when I wrote grant proposals to the National Institutes of Health, I would say that if you give me the funding to do this research, one day all of this will pay off and I will be able to address human disease. And that day ultimately arrived. So since I've been at Drexel for the past 20 years or so, at least the most recent, say 10, 15 years, most of the research, or at least half, a little over half the research in my lab has really shifted to disease. Here's the microtubule, and as Frank pointed out, it's made of tubulin subunits. It occupies axons and dendrites, two different types of elongated extensions from neurons. It acts as railways for molecular motor proteins to move along the surface. That's how things get to where they're going. Now inside the axon, inside these nerve cells, there are long and short microtubules, and they're both important. The long microtubules are like highways to get long distances. The short microtubules are very mobile. They move up and down the axon, and they give the axon some plasticity. They're both really important. Now, how do we get short microtubules? We get short microtubules from chopping the long microtubules. That's where they come from. And I actually hypothesized back in 1993, well, there must be proteins that sever microtubules. We didn't know what they were. I was a young guy at the time. I said, what the hell? I'll just hypothesize that something must exist to chop microtubules. And guess what? Ultimately, we found that they do. And there are key points, places in the neuron where severing of microtubules is really important. 
when axons form branches, the very tip of the axon is called a growth cone. That's a place where severing is really important. Now, take a look at these two cells. These are cells in culture. These are just simple fibroblasts. And you can see that one of the cells is very bright. So this one shows, in this fluorescent image, the microtubules. So it's full of microtubules. What we've done in the other panel is to make DNA for catonin and express it, overexpress it. So there's lots of it in this cell. And you can see those microtubules have just been chopped to bits. So that's a microtubule severing protein. Now, before you look at that and you think, well, that's a horrific tragedy, <laughs> physiologically, microtubule severing, when it's controlled just right, has important work to do. So as I said, axons have to have a nice balance. Some microtubules are long and some are short, and it's all controlled in a nice balanced way. Now here's spastin. And when we took a DNA construct made spastin, and we express that in these cells, it actually severs the microtubules even better than catonin. So they really get severed into these little tiny pieces. So spastin is genuinely a microtubule severing protein. Interestingly, if you overexpress spastin in neurons, the top one is just the normal situation. And you can see there's some little branches coming off these axons. If you overexpress spastin, you get a lot more branches. So it's really an important protein for determining the shape of neurons, the number of branches, all sorts of things that are really important for, for, for neurons to be what they are. So that's the normal state of affairs. You've got catonin, you've got spastin, you've got some other severing proteins, you've got microtubules that are really important for the shape of the neuron and for moving things around in the neuron. And now what about disease? What about hereditary spastic paraplegia? One of the things that I learned that I never knew before about disease is this loss of function and gain of function dichotomy. And I want to explain this very carefully, and I've got a couple of cartoons I want to show you. What is loss of function? Loss of function is that protein, that spastin, or whatever you're studying, that protein is really important and if you take it away, then the cell can't do things right because it doesn't have what it needs. That's loss of function. And loss of function is usually what's called haploinsufficiency because you have half as much, but not all you need. You've got one good spastin gene and one bad one, so it's called haplo. Half, half is not enough, haploinsufficiency. The one that's a little harder to understand is gain of function. But actually, gain of function is more common. You have this mutant spastin protein. And sure, it doesn't work right. But that's not really the big deal. The big deal is that that mutant spastin is a troublemaker. It's causing unexpected trouble. So it's not just that your microtubules aren't being severed. It's that protein that doesn't work right, that mutant protein, is doing crazy unexpected things. Now here's the, uh, the cartoon I want to show you. So it, the difference is, here's haploinsufficiency at this top. The kid just didn't show up to class. The gain of function, the kid showed up, and he's making trouble. So that's the difference. What would you rather have? The kid's just not there, or the kid's making trouble? Now here it gets worse. So with, with the gain of function mechanism, it may start out as the kid's just uh, putting a pencil on his nose, but it can get pretty bad over time. That's gain of function. And gain of function is actually much more common than loss of function. Say, for example, ALS. There's one form of ALS that's caused by a mutation to superoxide dismutase. Superoxide dismutase is important protein, but just being having a, you know, less set superoxide dismutase is not a terribly big deal. So why does the mutant protein, why does mutant superoxide dismutase cause ALS? It's because that mutant protein is misfolding and causing trouble. So if you look at HSP, the most prevalent view, at least several years ago, was haploinsufficiency. 
everybody thought it was haploinsufficiency. You look in the literature and people would say haploinsufficiency, haploinsufficiency. The geneticists thought it was haploinsufficiency. The clinicians thought it was haploinsufficiency. But I got into this as a basic scientist. And I got into this very, very interested in spastin and what it does. And if you tell me there's not enough spastin to do what it's supposed to do, my response would be, yes, that's what I've been studying. But when I looked at the different characteristics, you know, it didn't really look like that. Why is it just cortical spinal tracts? Isn't spastin important for all your neurons? Why just cortical spinal tracts? Why no developmental abnormalities? If half enough spastin isn't good enough, then why don't you have problems with your axons not being branched? You know, why would it be more of an adult onset sort of thing? Could it be gain of function? Could it be gain of function? And putting that question on the table really opened up a lot of controversy and debate. Now, one thing I think as a patient community that you're very fortunate about is that we as basic scientists and as clinicians, it's a good community. So this shows a little argument here, but I, my own experience is that whether it's the fundraisers, whether it's the administrators, whether it's the clinicians, we're all working really hand in hand in order to resolve what this disease is all about. But there has been a very robust debate, loss of function, gain of function. So what I want to do is tell you about the, the gain of function possibility, and we'll see really if this explains the disease better than loss of function. And don't worry, I'm getting to mice. We'll get to mice shortly. What's really kind of interesting about the spastin gene, and this is sort of unusual, is that it has two start codons. Now, I don't know if any of you have taken molecular biology courses, but when a gene encodes for a protein, there's a start codon, the whole thing gets started. And then some genes will have a different start codon. So down the line, they can start encoding for the protein. So in this case, you could make a longer protein and you can make a shorter protein, depending on if you start at the st first start codon or the second start codon. So the long protein, full length protein, is called M1, M1 spastin. And then the slightly shorter protein is called M87 spastin. M1 has a part, a region, that M87 doesn't have. And that region is very hydrophobic and hence very prone to misfolding. What do I mean by misfolding? Now, misfolding maybe is your, uh, your kid doesn't want to fold the towel, but it can, make you, it can make you really sick because proteins that misfold tend to accumulate. They don't go away, and they're troublemakers. Now, I know that most of you probably don't know what this looks like or what this is, but this is called a Western blot. And what you can see here, this is what we see for spastin for embryonic day 18. This is, this is rat. This is P0, that's newborn, that's 12 day, and that's adult. Everything you see here, all these bands, that's M87, 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 big fat bands, M87. Now you go into adult, M87's lower. There's not as much spastin in adults as in developing animals. But here's the big point. Look what you're seeing here that you never saw before. You're seeing this band up there. That's M1. And notice where you're seeing it is in the spinal cord. You don't see it in the brain, the cerebral cortex. In fact, you don't see M1 anywhere except for the spinal cord and except for adult. Does that start to make sense? When the M87, this is my hypothesis, when the M87 bears the mutation, that mutation's everywhere in your body, but it's not causing any trouble. The M1 is in your spinal cord. 
When that bears the mutation, it's got that hydrophobic domain. It can misfold like that towel I showed you. And it can be a troublemaker like those naughty kids I showed you. One of the first things we did, and we worked with neurons and culture, rat neurons and culture, and we did a lot of studies. We would dissect their brains and culture their neurons and express M1 and M87 spastins. We did a bunch of experiments. And here are four the, the, the students who have done a lot of this work with me over the years. Then we went to fly and worked with Dan Miranda, who's a fly expert at Drexel. And what I want you to see here, here's a normal fly. Here's a fly that we forced to express human mutant M87. And this fly looks a little bit goofy, but not too bad. It can still fly. It's still OK. This fly is expressing mutant M1. And it looks very goofy. It's holding its wings funny. It can't fly. If you put it on its back, it can't flip. So these studies in fly and these studies in rat cell culture consistently show that it's mutant M1 that has these, these troublemaking properties. This is squid. And what's neat about squid is that it has a big fat axon you can squeeze out. And you can actually do a lot of interesting studies. And my collaborator, Gerardo Morfini, did work on squid in which he exposed this extracted axoplasm to either mutant M1 or mutant M87. And again, uniformly, the mutant M87, no problem. Mutant M1, big problems. Now, you heard earlier today that there's over 200 different mutations of the SPAS gene. So doing this kind of study, we could look at a number of different mutations. And just like in Frank's work, whether it was a truncating mutation or missense or nonsense, whatever type of mutation it was didn't matter. They all had this in common. They produced deficits in the movement of organelles along axons in squid and produced these different um, behavioral abnormalities in flies. Squid and fly and cell culture of neurons, they're nice models. But ultimately, if we're going to test drugs and see if they really work, we need to have a vertebrate model with the symptoms of the disease. So you really need to have something like a mouse or a rat, something that you can test these drugs on. So we prepared a mouse. And if you think about what kind of mouse that you'd like to make, in order to, to model the disease and test your hypothesis. At the time, there were a number of mouse models people were using. But all of the mouse models are what are called knockouts. And what scientists would do is take a mouse and somehow delete one spastin gene or both spastin genes. And according to the haploinsufficiency model, that mouse should be a model for HSP. When this was done, even if it was a full knockout of both genes, the mouse had some symptoms, some motor neuron symptoms. But for the most part, nothing all that bad, even with both genes gone. There wasn't really much of a gate deficiency. So is that a good model for HSP? Well, people moved forward and they studied worms, C. elegans worms, and they knocked out spastin and said, here's my model for HSP. Or they looked at fly, here's my model for HSP. Amazingly, not very much symptoms with these animals. So we wanted to do what we did with the fly. We want to do it with the mouse. In other words, not in human mutant spastin. Oftentimes, by the way, human mutant proteins are not the same as, say, mouse mutant proteins. So some people would go in and they would mutate the mouse gene, spastin gene, to look like the human mutation. 
But what we wanted to do is knock in the human. And we wanted to do that for two reasons. One is that human genes are not always the same as mouse genes. And the other reason is we had a very, very specific hypothesis that we wanted to test. And that was gain of function. So we wanted to take an animal and say, look, you can have all of your normal spastin. We're not going to take any of it away. All we're going to do is add the human mutant on top. So this animal is not haploinsufficient. It's got all its normal spastin. We're just putting the mutant on top. This complicated slide just shows how this mouse is made. And I want to acknowledge a senior scientist in my lab, Dr. Chiang, and then Emanuela Piermarini, who is a postdoc in the lab, who's re really done all of this work. Now here's a wild type mouse. So this is a beam assay, and the mouse is walking on this beam, and it's walking pretty well. Now, I could fool you, and I could put on the same movie and tell you that this is the loss of function animal. This is the knockout animal. And you really couldn't tell the difference one way or the other. Because the knockout animal walks pretty normally. Maybe a little differently, but pretty normally. Let me show you our mouse. Now, here's our mouse. What do you see here? gait deficiency. And if you look carefully, you might see kind of shaking, a little spasticity. This mouse is about three months old. If I showed you this mouse at one month old, it would be perfectly normal. So we have adult onset gait deficiencies, remarkably like the human patient. And this animal is not haploinsufficient. It's only expressing human mutant spastin on top of its own spastin. So we made this mouse to test the model, to test the gain of function model, which I think it's done pretty well, but also in order to test therapy. Not to be the perfect model for HSP, but to test our hypothesis. Now, this shows some more data about the behavioral analyses. What happens in hereditary spastic paraplegia is that the cortical spinal tracts degenerate, but they degenerate in a specific way called dieback. They suck back, they die back from their synapses. So we want to take a look at our animal. I know this is a little bit complicated, but what you do is you inject dye in the brain of the animal in the motor cortex, and then you can look at the cortical spinal tracts with this dye. And normally, the axons would go all the way down to the lumbar level. But with our animal, they didn't. So you can see that a lot of these axons, if your eyes are good enough and you can see these little dotted lines, a lot of the axons degenerated in a dieback fashion. So our animal has dieback degeneration of cortical spinal tracts and the symptoms of the disease, adult onset. So I think it's pretty convincing. You hear a lot about axon swellings in the HSP field. A lot of people see axon swellings. We did not see axon swellings. We saw a dieback in our animal, but not axon swellings. Interestingly, the knockout mouse does show swellings. The human patient shows swellings. So what might this be telling us? This is a little bit complicated slide. Maybe I'll just go back so I don't confuse you. I have an idea of what's going on here. And that's that haploinsufficiency isn't wrong. It's just not the entire story. The haploinsufficiency renders the axon more vulnerable, weaker, more vulnerable to what? To the mutant proteins. The mutant proteins, the gain of function mechanism, that's what causes HSP. But the haploinsufficiency weakens the axon so that the mutant proteins are particularly toxic. If it weren't for the haploinsufficiency, the mutant proteins wouldn't be as toxic. 
And that's what I'm showing here in the schematic, that you've got the loss of function, haploinsufficiency. If that's all you had, it would be OK. You wouldn't see any degeneration. You'd see maybe some of these swellings, and you wouldn't maybe be perfect, but you wouldn't have HSP. If you have just the gain of function mechanism, now keep in mind, no patient has just the gain of function mechanism. This is just a mouse model. But you would have degeneration. You would have HSP. But in truth, in the patient, there's both going on simultaneously. And it's a much more severe degeneration as the patient endures both. Now, one of the things that the haploinsufficiency people, people who, who like this idea, will always say is they'll say, yeah, but there are some patients with a complete gene deletion. There is no spastin, and they do have hereditary spastic paraplegia. How do you explain that? There's no troublemaker, but they still have hereditary spastic paraplegia. And what I would say to that is 93 different genes that we know about cause HSP. And still, a whole lot of patients, we don't know. We still don't know all the genes that cause it. So if you've got a person with a full spastin deletion, I'm betting that that patient has a different gene mutation on top of that. And that if the patient only had the spastin deletion, he or she would probably be OK. Not perfect, probably OK. But that patient probably has a different gene mutation on top of it. I don't know that to be the case, but that would be my speculation. So what we're doing now to test this kind of everybody's right hypothesis is that we're crossing. We're taking our knock-in animal, and we have knockout animals, too, that we got from a colleague in the HSP community, and we're going to cross them. We think that's the best model for the disease because it's got both going on. But we also are wondering if that will test our hypothesis that both are important. The, HS, the, the, hap, the haploinsufficiency sets up the animal for the disease. But the mutant protein has to come along. And that second hit, that's what really causes the disease. So we cross the animals. And we're just getting started. This mouse work is very tedious and time consuming. And I don't want to make any promises. We've got a couple of animals. And they seem worse. They do seem worse. So I think we've got a good test of what we think is going on here happening. And I hope we come up with the best model of all for this disease. So if Frank wants to put some cough syrup in our animal, I think that, that we would love to be able to do something like that, or a variety of other kinds of, uh, of uh, potential treatments. So the lesson here, what is the right therapy? And the right therapy is one that addresses the mechanism properly. If you've got the wrong mechanism, you could very well get the wrong therapy. So I think that's what's good about kind of the tension and the arguments and the debates in the scientific community, as long as they're productive as opposed to counterproductive, is by having these little squabbles that we do, these scholarly squabbles, we can come up with the right mechanism so that we don't spend years and years and years and years pursuing the wrong mechanism, and then ultimately we don't have anything. Take the Alzheimer's field, for example. Every so often, you pick up the New York Times, and someone's got some idea for a new drug for, for Alzheimer's disease. I'll look at it, and I'll say, that's not going to work. A few years later, it didn't work. There's a lot of resources wasted when you've got the wrong mechanism. So I think, as a community, we can come together, we get the right mechanism, and then we can get really good therapies. So lessons, know your mechanism. Basic science is something I'm a real big advocate for. Therapy requires the right tool. And also, you do really, I, mean, I love these, these, these human IPS cell lines. We're doing that too. But ultimately, you have to have a behavioral model to test. So a good animal model is really important. So with that, I'll just show a long list of people 
in my lab over the years. Students, postdocs, collaborators, a lot of people who've contributed to this. And I also really do want to thank the Spastic Paraplegia Foundation providing essential funding for this. Without the, the money from the Hereditary Spastic Paraplegia Foundation, we couldn't do this. It's, it's very hard to get money from NIH for this kind of work because it's a rare disease. It's a very hard. So without those valuable dollars, we really would not have been able to do this. Also, the Tom Wallach Foundation, which is a, a similar foundation that's, that's based in Europe, mainly in Germany, they've also given us money. And we're, we're, we're very thankful. So to those of you who have worked hard in the fundraising process, I really know for us to buy our cell cultures and our animals and all the things we do, many people in this room are out there on hot days doing what you do, gathering together resources. And I want you to know that, that we're using your dollars just as effectively as we possibly can in this common effort that, that we share. So with that, let me just thank you for your very kind attention. OK, I see one way over to the oh, right Oh, OK. Oh. oh. I'm coming back to you. <laughs> well, you've had three questions already. Yeah. <laughs> We're keeping count now. Yeah. Here we go. Back on your uh, first or second slide where you showed the number of uh, very, uh, the percentage of gene variations that are HSP related, you had a second number in the, along with the percentages. Were those the number of actual variations of the 93 that? Uh, you know, I actually just don't remember. I don't know. Let's take a look. Here we go. Oh, uh, what is that? Yeah, that's yeah, 24. That, that that I think so. I think that's the number of cases that this was done in, to the best of my knowledge. So, so yeah, under 3% in this particular study, they had one case of SPG-10, one case of SPG-22. So it's a sample. It's a sample. You have very good eyes. That's amazing. I was paying attention. Yeah. OK, another question. This side of the room real quick while I'm over here. OK, I guess I'm going that way. OK, coming back to the middle. Here we go. Mm. Okay, because this comes on or tends to come on around age 45, basically, it means something was happening earlier in life which mitigated the symptoms. Is this because the cells were able to break down the mutant M1 through autophagy, phagy, um, whereas when you get older, that process slows down and it couldn't keep up? I don't know for sure, but that's exactly what I think. So you have a process that is ongoing in your body autophagy, and there's also something called the proteasome that are breaking down proteins. And autophagy is breaking down problematic, misfolded proteins that are not quite right. And autophagy is very robust when you're young. As you grow older, the autophagy system gets more sluggish. And I think this is exactly my hypothesis, that the, the, the mutant M1 has to accumulate to a certain level. And then all of a sudden, you just, you just can't, you can't handle it anymore. It's too much. And then you start seeing the symptoms. I think that's also probably why it's the corticospinal tracts. Because the corticospinal tracts have these very long axons, and I suspect that they're just stressed in terms of autophagy, that the challenge is greatest in the cortical spinal tracts. Probably everywhere else, the reason why you don't see M1, even wild type M1, is, is that the, the, the proteasome and the autophagy systems, they're very effective at degrading this protein. But as we get older and autophagy poops out, I think this is also probably a reason why it is that some people can get quite old and they've got the mutation, but they're not sick. Why is that? I bet it's because those people have a very effective autophagy system. 
So autophagy enhancing drugs are another potential avenue for therapy. Okay, another question right next door. Our daughter and both of her little girls were diagnosed with mast cell activation syndrome. Is that any way related to me? Did I pass that to them? And what do you have? HSP and Sjogren's and, yeah. and spasmodic dysphonia. Well, I don't know. I, I, I don't know. It doesn't seem to me like a person with one disease would pass a different disease on to children that you should feel as if that's the causation. And yet, many of these diseases are genetic. Maybe you did pass it on to her, but it has nothing to do with your disease. It's entirely possible. I don't know enough about these different diseases to really give you an authoritative answer. So I don't know if, say for example, if you have a spastin mutation, if in your daughter that may potentially manifest as problems in different types of cells. These are very complicated diseases. And you know, you wonder why it is that you've got spastin in all the cells of your body or any of these proteins that correspond to the genes. But why is the disease targeted to particular types of cells, in this case the corticospinal tracts? I think in this case the autophagy issue really is the best explanation, but we just don't know. So I, I can't give you a definitive answer. But I, I, I kind of doubt it's because you have HSP. That's why she has a different disease. Uh, Dr. Fink has a question. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, fascinating. I was taking notes. A um, couple comments. One, as you point out, the uh, knockout models of uh, spastin don't have much of a behavioral phenotype. And we made several of them. And uh, they didn't have much of a, of a phenotype, just as you said. We made a knock-in of uh, SPG6 in a rat, and then it was subsequently made in mouse. And that is a knock-in, and it has a very robust phenotype. So I, um, there has been no knockout to compare it to, but my point is that there is another type of HSP with a knock-in model, very robust paralysis in three to six months, that kind of thing in uh, vertebrate models. And so there's another form in which there's some strong evidence of a gain of, of a toxic gain of function. Mm -hmm. So that's one. Second, um, would you predict, I don't know if you've done these experiments, but there, as you know, there's uh, discussion and projects underway for gene therapy, at giving a, a normal spastin gene uh, as a, in, whatever, in whatever viral vector form to as potential therapy for SPG4. And um, I'm wondering about, um, they have, that hasn't been done in humans yet, but I'm wondering if you would predict that um, the addition of an, a, an additional copy of uh, the normal gene might exacerbate the problem in, uh, with a gain of function mutation background. Well, if you're adding another normal spastin gene, and if you can do it in a way that would restore the normal spastin levels in a controlled way, I would guess it would be helpful because you would rectify this exacerbation of the haploinsufficient component. That would be my guess. But I would be very cautious about it because if you get too much spastin, you're in big trouble because you're going to chop up your microtubules like crazy. OK, another question up front here. Oh, come on. Excuse me. Hello. I'm confused. Um, I have adult, uh, I have HSP, and I'm 45 and really started walking bad recently. So this is all kind of new to me. But it was described to me as a disease where you have neurons that malfunction 
And so then you have extra spasticity causing contraction in your legs and you get the dropped gait. And then you're talking about spastin. Is spastin and spasticity the same thing? And SPG4 is a gene that's called spe what? Well, <laughs> the gene. The Am I gene, not the only confused one, or is that? Well, the gene answer? is called either SPG4 or SPAST. The protein is called SPASTIN. Why? Now, the reason why it's called that is because the first time anyone was really aware of it is in patients with hereditary spastic paraplegia. So that's why it was called that. Before that, nobody had any idea why or anything about this, this, this gene or this protein. So that's why it was called that. So for the longest time, nobody knew what the protein was. If I had discovered the protein, if the basic science community had discovered the protein, I would have called it cut in or sever in or something like that because it severs microtubules, it cuts microtubules. I would have called it by its function. It was called spastin because it was discovered in the patients. Is my assessment of the disease correct? Is that what happens? Like the, is that what you're saying and then it just causes spasticity in the legs? Well, what happens in hereditary spastic paraplegia is that the cortical spinal tracts die back, they, they pull back from where they're supposed to be connected. So now you don't have your, 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 your nerves wired up the way they're supposed to be. So that manifests, you're not getting the signals down there so that your, your muscles are weaker and they're not working right. Great question. One more on this side of the room and then I'll try the other side. Anywhere over here? Right there, in the back. So my daughter um, is SPG4. She started showing symptoms at 15 years old, so a lot younger than the average. So based on what you were just saying, would your theory be that her autophagy system is not as strong as a lot of other people's, or that perhaps she has another gene that we're not aware of yet that's playing into that? Well, there was recently a, a big patient study that was done, and there are male-female differences, and females can have an earlier onset, I believe, if I remember that correctly, and somewhat more severe uh, symptoms. So I don't think age 15 is really out of the realm of the average. The average is, is 45. Uh, there are, I know there are a lot of young men that show in their early 20s for a young woman to show at 15. I don't really think that's out of the range of being normal. So the autophagy hypothesis is just simply a hypothesis for now. We've never really tested it. But no, I, I wouldn't go home and say, you have a bad autophagy system. I don't, I don't think I would conclude that. OK, one more. Anything over here? There we go, in the front right. I'm coming. Uh, yes, sir. Has there been comparative studies between SPG3A and SPG4? If I'm correct in my assumptions, the SPG3A, which I have, has early onset as compared to SGB, SPG4. My honest answer is I don't know. I'm not a clinician, and I don't study the other ones, so I'm just not the authority. Probably you should have a chat with Dr. Fink about that because I just don't know. But one of the things I think in response to that that I'll just stress, as I did earlier, is that we really don't know if SPG4 and SPG3A are the same disease or not. They may look like the same disease, but they may not be the same disease. There's one of them, I forgot which one it is, I forgot the number, but there's one of them that is very early onset and very severe symptoms. And it's just not like the others at all, and I'm not even sure why it was called hereditary spastic paraplegia. But, um, I don't know. I don't know if you compare your disease with SPG4 
if there is a similar mechanism, if ultimately it comes down to the microtubules or ultimately comes down to a common gain of function target that we just don't know about. See, gain of function could be anything. It's just a troublemaker. It can be making all sorts of trouble that we just, just don't know. Maybe it's trouble with the ER. Maybe it's trouble with something else. So it's possible. It's possible that with, with uh, SPG3A, it's, it's the same thing. It's just affected more strongly earlier, but maybe not. Maybe not. OK, everybody, thank you very much. Dr. Box. Thank you.